Welcome back to To Tell the Truth, panel and audience. You know the way the game is played. Our three chefs here all claim to be the real Claude Man. Two are lying and only one has signed a statement swearing to tell the truth. So please open up the affidavits that you have in front of you, which you are now opening and seeing for the first time. And follow along with me as I read the sworn testimony of the real Claude Man. I, Claude Mann, cook up meals for movies. As co-creator and head chef of a cooking slash movie of the week TV show, I create recipes based on America's favorite films. Try my Star Wars inspired Obi-Wan cannolis. <laughs> or my ode to one of last year's Oscar nominees, a double dip Juliette Brioche. <laughs> I also share recipes inspired by films like Pretty Woman, Tootsie, and Dirty Dancing in my Dinner and a Movie cookbook. Bon Appetit, signed Claude Mann. It's time now to find out which one of our players is the real cinematic chef. Will a real Claude Mann please stand up? Obi-Wan cannoli. That's just got to rank up there with the bad jokes of all time, doesn't it? <laughs> but the reason I chose that is I think it's not only a show that probably a lot of you are familiar with, but that end of this part, end of the show, where they actually say, will the real Claude stand up? They always do that. Like, who's it going to be, right? And I was thinking, we are talking about, I think, one of the most critical, important topics for us to get from a spiritual perspective is what is my identity now that I am a follower of Jesus? But I already told you at the beginning, it takes a long time for it to sink in and to really be who you think of yourself as being. And I think that as you go along in your, in your week, there's all kinds of challenges to your identity. Sometimes it's like somebody making fun of you. I have to tell you that my Sutherland staff has recommended that I get a new tattoo. I think I should get a tattoo right here of a little guy mowing grass. <laughs> we can identify ourselves by how we look. We can identify ourselves by what our home of origin was like. We can identify ourselves by our successes or our gifts. We can identify ourselves by our failures. And in those moments of insecurity, in those moments where you're challenged, I feel like there's a whole bunch of identities sitting at a bench. And it's like, will the real Paul Glazner, who is now in Christ, stand up? Or will the Paul Glazner, who is shaped by other things, stand up? And I think that's honestly how we finally grasp it, is when we hit those points where our identity is challenged, then we start knowing, what am I reaching for? What is that defining me? Am I worried about what other people think? Am I thinking about my own successes? Am I trying to hide my failures? What, what's really going on? And that's why I think this is such a critically important topic. And we are spending these last six weeks talking about first, second, and third, the first, second, and third chapter of Ephesians, and we're talking about who is God and who am I, and who is God and who am I, and who is God and who am I, in order to try to spend some time really letting this sink in. And then we are going to do the second half of Ephesians next year. And we said we were going to do it in the fall, and several of you went, wait a minute, that's way too long. We will have forgotten everything you said already, which is so encouraging. <laughs> so, so we want you to know that we heard you, and we are going to do that after Easter instead. But chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians are all about if I have a right identification of who God is, if I have a right identity of now that I'm a follower of Jesus, then what are my attitudes and behaviors, my relationships, my tongue, my marriage, my parenting, my employer-employee, how does that now live out who God is and who I am? So that's how you can tell if you're getting it. If the decisions and the attitudes of the rest of Scripture are being played out in your life in a natural way. And so we're going to spend this last week on this series talking about chapter 3 and talking about who am I. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. And 
We're going to segue again from what Pastor Will talked about last week from chapter 3, which was, who is God? And I want to start with a verse that he kind of spent the first part of the message on. It says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And he started with the fact that God is a God of mystery, that he has told us some things, but he hadn't told us everything. And that God reveals things, and that is how we know what the truth is. And then he goes on to say, we are heirs with Israel, we're members together, and he uses the picture of a human body, like we're different parts of a body, and we're sharers together in all the promises that are in Christ Jesus. And that is some pretty heady, amazing statements about us. And I boiled it down to a pretty simple statement, it's, I'm included, I'm in, I'm connected, And if you've come to the place where you have understood who Jesus is and you have committed your life to him, then the Bible says that you have had a complete change of identity. So to kind of emphasize what we've been talking about these last couple of weeks, let me me walk through who we were. You know, we have a great fallacy to think, you know, I'm a pretty good person. Well, according to the scriptures, we weren't a pretty good people. This was our status. You were dead. Spiritually, we're dead. You didn't care about God. You didn't care about the future. You didn't care about anything. Mostly, we care about ourselves. It says we were enslaved. We lived out of the cravings of our sinful nature, that we were caught in just following other people and doing our own desires, and we were literally slaves to sin. He says we were under wrath. Pretty scary statement. It says God is the righteous judge, sees all of our goodness. And you know, when you think you're a pretty good person, you read through the scriptures, you come to realize that my idea of pretty good means I'm self-righteous and I judge other people and I compare myself and I give myself lots of credit where I don't deserve it and I rationalize my sin. That's what pretty good means. And God is an absolute holy judge. And he says, no, you're deserving of punishment. You are under the sentence of my wrath. That's where you are without Christ. If you try to stand before a holy God and give an account for your life, good luck. He says you're under wrath. And then he says you're excluded. He talked about the fact that God had worked with the Jewish people and they had a temple and they had the the sacrifices and a way of approaching the holy God. And he says you guys were so far out there, you weren't in Israel, you weren't in the covenants, you didn't even know about any of God's promises, you were excluded You were outside the circle. And then these were perhaps the two most poignant statements. He says, you're without hope and without God in the world. You're without hope. There's no way you can save yourself. There's no way you can clean up your act and do a little better. There's no way that you're going to spend forever in heaven. What's your hope? Just to try to make it through as best you can. That's why a lot of people are living And he says, and you're without God. You're trying to handle the incredible difficulties and the choices of life without God. Now let me tell you, that is a bleak perspective, isn't it? You see, the amazing news of the gospel is not amazing news until you understand the bad news of where we were and how desperately we need it. Otherwise, it's just kind of good news. If you understand this, it's amazing grace. It's great news. And so he says, what are we now? If you've given your life to Christ, if you've understood what his sacrifice on the cross meant, if you have realized your desperate need, now, in Christ, who am I? He says, I'm alive. I've been given spiritual life. I've been given eternal life. I now have Christ living in me. That life is mine. He says, you're now free, that you have the power, not only from your past sins, but God gives you the power, and he's starting to change your attitudes and actions in your life so that you can live a different way. He says, you were under wrath and now you're forgiven. The Bible says outrageous things like we're holy, we're acceptable in God's sight, that we are blameless. Can you imagine somebody describing you as blameless? Ah, that is a stretch of faith, isn't it? He says, we are forgiven and we have all the goodness of Jesus when we stand before our Holy Father. And then he says, you were excluded, now you're included. You who had no right to be here. You're at the very center of who God is and what he's doing. 
You have been included in everything. In fact, he says you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. I don't even know what all that means, but it sounds really good, doesn't it? He said you were without hope, now you're sealed forever. The Holy Spirit has stamped you and he says, now you belong to me and I'm going to hang on to you. My eternal security is not based on my faith, it's based on God's got a hold of me and he's never going to let me go. And that's security. And he says, we're without God and now he says, God dwells in you. That literally God wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to like come in and eat and drink in our home. He wants to be with us. And that is incredible. And I think it's easy for us, especially if you've been a follower of Christ for a while, that when you hear the gospel, when you hear the story, it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's true. But we've lost our wonder, we've lost our awe, we've lost a sense of, I can't believe this is my life. And I believe that part of what Ephesians wants to do is to bring us back and have us be awestruck again by the amazing thing that God is big enough to fill the universe. He shouldn't even know our planet exists, let alone love us individually and have chosen us and have brought us into his, his kingdom. And so in that process of re-understanding our identity, a couple of things struck me, and I think I want to just make a couple of comments that I think relate to this whole series. And one is that this truth that I'm sharing with you is not deduced. It's not, re- it's not something I can figure out by myself. It has been revealed by God to us. Because sometimes that story, and the story of the scriptures, makes absolute sense with everything else we know, but what I'm saying is you can't figure it out by yourself. We, we often try to show the rationality of belief, and it is it really makes sense to believe that God is who he says he is, but, but you can't take nature and my human nature and minus sin and you can't you can't take a number of factors that you can observe without the scriptures and come to final conclusions i was talking with a, an intentional transient how's that a nice way for saying things this week and uh and we got talking about spiritual things and i asked him if he believed in god and he actually was very god conscious he thought god was speaking to him he was looking for signs he was afraid of disobeying god And so he had a very strong God consciousness. And then I said, what, do you believe in Jesus? He said, yeah, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I thought, interesting. And then he finished the sentence with, just like we were all sons of God. It's like, (laughs) we just went off track there. And then he talked about how all of us have parts of God within us. And and I asked him what his purpose of life was. And his purpose of life was to help lower class people connect to upper class people and people who are homeless connect to people who are established so they can get to know each other. And I thought, that's not a bad thing. It's not what I would call an ultimate cause. And I think it's kind of a jilting at windmills in some ways of trying to make that happen. But, but the whole thing is, is people start, <laughs> let me say it like this, people make religion up without an, a license every day of the week. They're putting together a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Christianity, and this is kind of my own personal mix. And you know, that only works if nothing else is true. If it's all relative, it means nothing is really true. And and the truth is, is that what God has told us is wonderful, but if you try to figure everything out, it's more like this. A plus B times giraffe minus Pluto. I didn't make that up. That was somebody gave me that. And what I'm saying is that God has revealed himself to us. And why do we know that those things are true? Why do we know that God cares about us that much? Why do we know what I am like like now that I'm in Christ? Because this is what it says here. It makes sense, but the world by wisdom doesn't know God. But it's a revealed thing, which is why the Bible is so important, which is why studying it is so important, which is why letting it challenge and transform our identity is so important. And the second thing I want to bring out, which I think is, well, this is, this is part of that respect for God. Deuteronomy 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. You see, people often come as new Christians and they say, I want to study the Bible and get my questions answered. I always think, what a great idea. 
And you know what's going to happen to them? They're going to get all those questions answered. And then what are they going to have more of? More questions. And finally, they're going to come to this verse. (laughs) The secret things belong to the Lord. He's not told us everything we want to know. He's told us everything he thinks we need to know. And sometimes the answer is we don't know. Why did that happen? How does this work? How did, the, how did the sacrifice of Christ pay for my sin? I don't understand all how that works. I just know it's true. Why? Because God said it. And he, and he says we need to understand that there's a line, that God is still mysterious, but he's told us what he wants us to know so that our lives can be transformed. And the other, day, the other thing I just want to make a point of is it's easy, I think, for us to think of the fact that we've done a week on who is God and then a week on who am I and a week on who is God and a week on who am I. Do not misunderstand that it's just as important who you are as who God is. We have an amazing tendency to make everything about me. And uh, this scripture struck me as we were going through Ephesians. It said his intent, that is God's intent, was now through the church The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. The reason he's chosen me, the reason he's put together us as a church is so that the manifold, which means the multifaceted, beautiful, incredible, many-angled, many-branched wisdom of God should be made known to some group of rulers and heavenly beings and angels and seraphim and cherubim and demons and he lets everybody know. So here's the critical understanding. What's more important, infinitely more important, is that I know who God is. And out of that will come a wonderful side benefit is I will know who I am. So I just saw a good example of this. My uh, four-year-old granddaughter, Elaine, was the flower girl in her uncle's wedding. And she got to have her fancy little dress and she was twirling and she thought this was so amazing and everybody dressed up and there was this incredible meal with all kinds of place settings and a whole sit-down full deal meal. And it occurred to me as I was talking with her and playing with her that in her little mind, all of this was for her. (laughs) And so I was trying to kind of tease her out of it and I said, so who's getting married? Uncle Ben, and who's he marrying? Me. And I said, what about Amy? She's marrying me too. And isn't that a picture of our human nature? That if there's anything good, I take credit for it. If there's anything bad, I blame everybody else for it. Because one of the most profound spiritual truths that there is, is it's not all about me. In fact, conversely, it is all about him. And so I feel like we are understanding not only who I am, not just for my benefit so I can do better, but so that I can bring more glory to God, so that he can be made more famous, so that his manifold wisdom will be displayed, not only on earth, but everywhere. We are an exhibit in the museum of the greatness of God. That's why we need to understand. That's why we need to obey. That's where it all fits. Not just so I can have a better life, but so that God can get more glory. So we need to understand what it means that he's revealed his truth to us and it is for his glory and not for mine. That the chief end of man is to glorify God and to what? Enjoy him forever. And so often we turn that around. The chief end of man is to be happy and to have God do what I want him to do. So my life will be better. And we continually reverse that role. So the second point I want to draw out, not only that I'm included, but now I am deeply, deeply, deeply loved. There is so much of a pandemic of loneliness in our culture. Ironically, the richer we get, the more wealth we have as a nation, the more wealth we have individually, the more separated from each other we get, and the more isolated people get. And the more the chief problems become not malnutrition and disease, but depression and loneliness and suicide. And I believe 
that if we could understand this next part at a cellular level, that the God of the universe not only has chosen me, but he loves me more than I can imagine. And if we can get that, even in a small measure, it's going to change. It's a game changer for your life. And I want you to see how strongly he says it. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Isn't that incredible? Paul goes to such extremes to say, I want you to see how high and how wide and how deep, and he's just trying to use every word he can to say, you don't have a clue how much God loves you. And you know, I think the beautiful thing is when I understand the power and the beautiful and the manifold wisdom of God, and when I understand how much he loves me, Paul says something in here that just kind of caught my attention. In chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me. You know, I I read other places where Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles. And I don't know about you, but sometimes your mind just goes to what you've read before. And when I read that the first time, I was thinking he's the least of the apostles, you know, because he killed people and, you know, he was the last guy in and, you know, you kind of... But what he says is, I'm the least of all the Lord's people. You're thinking, the Apostle Paul is the least. Where does that put me? Right? But I think what he's saying here is when you get a glimpse of the greatness of God, and especially when you get the glimpse that he loves me, the automatic response should be humility. I don't deserve this. I can't imagine it. This is incredible. Why me? And Paul could say without even hesitating, I'm the least and I received grace. I think we could all say that, but we don't. we don't. We don't want people to point out how we're the least. We want to try to keep making ourselves better or look better. <laughs> Would you all agree that we all want to look better than we want to be better? Yeah. Because we're, we're not as humble. And I think if you can see this, you also immediately have a deep sense of gratitude Love is such a powerful force. It's the most powerful force in the universe. You know that? And we so desperately need love. And love touches us. About 80% of the songs and 70% of the movies are about love. And I was thinking of an old couple that was in the church I was in before. And his name was Kingsley and her name was Peter Peter Nella. And they were both widowed and they'd been single in the church for a long time. And then... One day in prayer meeting, their eyes met over the crowded room and they started seeing each other and they started this funny, very (laughs) slow courtship. And I remember them walking down the aisle of the church holding hands in their mid-80s. And as they went down the aisle, everybody smiled as they went by. Why? Because we love that. We see that. We know people need that at every level. And he says, Paul says, I want you to be rooted in love. I want your feet to go deep down in the cement of God's love. I want you to be unmovable because you know that you're loved. And I don't know how to get that to your heart. He said, I want you to know how high and wide and broad and deep, and I want you to get a picture of this. And you know, in America, 20 to 35% of Americans say they are chronically lonely. Loneliness increases the risk of death by 29%. It adds to dementia, depression, and heart disease. Loneliness, chronic loneliness, deep loneliness, listen, this is an amazing statistic, is worse for you than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. It's deathly. And you know, doesn't that make being in church family, being a connected part, being in a place where there's amazing people, that makes it so much more important. But people can feel lonely in the middle of a crowd, you know? And he says, I want you to know that you're loved. And I believe 
that this very formula where he says, I want you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that a sort of a paradoxical statement? I want you to know what you can't really fully know. You know what that tells me? He says, I want you to experience and have a growing understanding to comprehend what you will never finally fully get. But your life as you grow in your follower of Christ should be a growing process of experiencing the love of God. Amen. That we should get more of that every year that goes by. It shouldn't become ho-hum and oh well. It should become wow, more and more. He says, I want you to experience, to know, to have a relationship in a way that blows your mind. He says, I want you to be growing, to comprehend, to hold on to, to live in. And I truly believe that if you have a dynamic relationship with Christ and you understand who your identity is, you will never be fully chronically lonely again. You'll be alone. In fact, sometimes alone is nice. But that desperate sense of loneliness... God says, I want to replace your need for people with a relationship with me. And so many people get married and so many people are looking for friends just so that they can find somebody to give them life because they are desperate. And two desperate people don't work well together. And listen carefully. People will never give you, even good people, even caring people, even loving people, they will never fill your cup in the way that God can. Because we are created with a deep need for being loved by God and being known by God and being connected to God. And no matter how popular you are or how many people you surround yourself with, it will never be enough. But God's love will be enough. And when you find that out, it changes your relationships. You come, how can you forgive people that are going to do it again? How can you love people that are irritating I keep lobbying for changing the marriage vows to love, honor, and annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> you notice it's the older couples that laugh the hardest, that's what you notice? He says, my goal for you is that Christ might live in your hearts through faith. That He might be, one of the versions says, at home in your hearts. And you know the difference between a house and a home? When you first get something, no matter how nice it is, no matter how well it's been uh, set up by whoever, a home is not a house. I mean, a house is not a home until there's love there, until there are people you care about, until you spend some time. And, and Christ says, I want to be at home in your heart. I want that to be our relationship. And there's a powerful little pamphlet called My Heart, Christ's Home, written by Robert Munger. And he walks through this as an extended metaphor about Christ literally coming to live in my heart and he makes it like a house and, and Christ goes into the library and says, hmm, interesting things you're reading. And there's a whole bunch of kind of humorous things in it where he says he's going to go out with his friends on Friday night and Jesus said, can I come? <laughs> and he says, I don't think you would be uh, very comfortable where I'm going. He said, tomorrow night we'll go to a Bible study, but I'd like you to stay home tonight. And all of a sudden he thought, I brought him as a guest to my home and now I'm ditching him for some other friends. And he goes through uh, some very profound statements. But one of the things that really struck me was he talked about Jesus wanted to get together with him every morning and he takes the books, the 66 books off the library shelf and he said, let's talk through these and let me tell you about myself and about life and about your life. And so he talks about spending this time with the Lord every morning. And then there was this great part where he says, but little by little under the pressure of many responsibilities, that time began to be shortened. Why, I don't know that I would be too busy to spend time with Christ. That was not intentional. It just kind of happened. And first it was a few shortening of the times and then I missed a day and then a couple of days and, and pretty quick sometimes whole weeks would go by without. And then he goes by one day and he says he's hurrying on his way out the door. And he said, I look in the living room and I saw a fire in the fireplace and Jesus was sitting there and suddenly in dismay I thought to myself he was my guest I invited him into my heart he's come as lord of my home yet I'm neglecting him so I turned and went in and with a downcast glance I said master forgive me have you been here all these mornings yeah he said I told you I'd be here every morning to meet with you then I was even more ashamed he had been faithful in spite of my faithlessness and I asked his forgiveness 
And he readily forgave me, as he always does when we're truly repentant. But then he said to me, get this, the trouble with you is this, you've been thinking of the quiet time, of the Bible study, of the prayer time, as only a factor in your own spiritual progress. You have forgotten what this hour means to me. I love you. I redeemed you at great cost. I value your fellowship. Now, do not neglect neglect this hour, if only for my sake. Whatever else may be your desire, remember, I want your fellowship. You think all the way through the scriptures. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you love me, then my Father will love you. And we will come in and we will dwell with you. We will make our home with you. He says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I'll come in and I will eat with you and drink with you. And there's this picture, incredible as it might seem, that God delights in our company. (laughs) Does God need you? Is he broke and he's down to his last nickel and you need to loan him something? Is he lonely and doesn't have any friends? No. He doesn't need us, but he loves us. And he wants to dwell with us. He wants to have that relationship with us. And when I begin to grasp that, then it also changes the direction of my life, the, the purpose of my life. And I believe that I am destined for great things. I believe that God has a plan for me. We talked about the picture of the potter shaping the pot and that, that I'm clay and once God gets me centered, then he can begin to shape me, not only into something beautiful, but into something useful. And I believe that our dreams are way too small because the reality is, is Revelation, or, excuse me, Ephesians 3.20 says, 3.16 says, I pray without of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being because he wants us to understand that we were designed with a purpose, that he's created us, that he's given us your personality, your experiences, the, the, all the things that you think are, are yours are gifts from God. If there's anything good about me, it's a gift from God and from other people. And that is the truth, isn't it? That humility is just honesty. And he says, I pray that you might understand that you were designed with a purpose. And then he goes on, and there's this incredible verse right at the end of the chapter. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. God wants to do more in your life. He wants you to have more joy. He wants you to be more like Christ. He wants you to have more of his attitudes and his mindset. He wants your life to be more impactful of the unbelievers around you. He wants your life to be more transformative of the believers around you. He wants to do more than you can ever believe. And we're thinking, I think God can do this if he's really powerful. And he says, you have no idea what I could do. I believe as we walk through these chapters, if you understand who God is, if you understand what his plan is, it will invariably make your faith bigger. And that faith will be personal. What God wants for you. We often worry about what God wants from us. Have you ever thought about what he wants for us? And I look back in my own life and I think, you know, if you could have seen me as a skinny, gawky junior high kid, we lived in a town in the middle of the Utah desert. I was a preacher's kid in a Mormon town. That's a good way to get popular. We were poor, we were in the middle of nowhere, 60 miles from the nearest town. When people complain that their town had nothing to do when they grew up, it's like we had nothing to do. And yet, if you could see what my dreams would have been at that point, it would have been so small, so unimportant, so tame. And yet as I look back over my life and I think of what God has done and given me the wife that he's given me and given me three daughters who have come to fellowship with us because they love Jesus too to give us to be part of this church family that started with 35 people and now is spreading over the county, to give us the incredible friends and relationships, to to give us our health and our possessions and and to give us the place of privilege and influence that we have. It's mind-blowing to me. 
And one of the things we prayed when we came to Sutherland is, God, would you do something so big here, everybody would know it had to be you. Isn't that a great picture for your life? If God said, I know that has to, if, if the people around you say, I know that has to be God, I, I knew them before. <laughs> you see, sometimes we think of people who are talented and articulate and prominent, and we think, wow, God could really use them. But there's a lie that's embedded in our soul that says God couldn't really do something with me. And I want you to dream bigger. I want you to believe that God can win so much in your life, that there would be huge impact for the kingdom of God because of who you are and what he wants to do in you. And so much of it has to do with simply believing what he says is true about him and what is true about me. And then go for it. And you know, you can't fail because even if you fail, God can use your failures. And God wants more. He wants more for family church. He wants more for you individually. He wants more. And if you surrender, if you give in, if you believe, it's not, a, it's not a dangerous thing. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's wonderful. You would never want to trade it for anything else. And I'm going to hand off to our South Umpqua campus and Sky is going to share the last bit here and, uh, and Drew is going to be at our green campus. And I uh, just want to hand that off to you guys. I thought about how do we try to help you grasp this and wrestle with this and it's so easy to get a good lesson and a good idea and then you just kind of forget it in the middle of everything else and so if you want to pick up there is a bookmark that's on your seat you already stuck it somewhere probably and uh, pull it out and it's very very simple it says Ephesians says because God is and then it just walks through some of the things that we've studied and looked at about God And we could put a lot more on there, but sometimes when I get a list that's too long, I get none of it. So I want you to think about what's on there. And then the reverse side says, Ephesians says, and it's therefore because God says, this is what I am. I'm loved, I'm brought near, I'm chosen, I'm sealed, I'm blessed. And I want you to look at that every day this week. So I want you to stick it somewhere, you will see it. Put it on the dashboard of your car, Put it on your mirror where you do your makeup or shave. Put it, you could put it in a book, I guess. That's an interesting idea. You could put it in your Bible. But I want you to put it somewhere where you're going to see. And I want you to reflect on that. Instead of, oh yeah, I want you to say, oh wow. And then let that guide you into the more that God has for you. And then we put a whole bunch of them out there. So I want to encourage you to grab an extra. Grab one from the seat by you or there's some out in the lobby. And listen, I want you to give it to somebody who needs it this week. Somebody whose life is full of loneliness and depression and struggle. And I want you to say, you know what we're learning at church? We're learning because of who God is. This is what it makes us if we follow him. And I'd like you to encourage you with this. And maybe God has already put somebody on your heart and mind that you could give that to. And that could be a part of your beginning a dialogue with them. Because listen carefully. God is the source of hope. He's the source of love. He's the source of building our lives. He's the source of blessing. Why wouldn't they want that? You know, I think sometimes we, we say no for them. We say, well, they would never be interested in this. You know what? People are desperate for love. And if they can believe that God loves them, it will begin a change in their life that you'll be a privilege to be a part of. So I want you not only to take one for yourself, I want you to take one And I want you to give it away. And I want you to ask God that he would help you grasp and to know what is unknowable. Father, thank you for these powerful lessons from Ephesians. Thank you for how bedrock this is of who we understand you to be and and put you in your rightful place. And then in humility, we put ourselves as connected to you and related to you and available for your use. And God, I pray all week long as we hit those places where our identity is challenged and, and different, <laughs> different imposters want to stand up and say, I'm the real one. That, Father, who we are in Christ would stand up and say, this is the truth. And that we would begin to live out of who you have made us to be. And that because of that, it would change our relationships, our marriages, our parenting, our 
neighboring because we understand a little bit about how much you love us and that we forgive others because you forgave us and we love others because you've loved us and that everything flows out of all that you've given to us. In Jesus' great name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me. Or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.